Okay, so I'll be doing the last presentation. And this is one I created because of the uh, number of questions that we get and some of the problems that we see across the state with um, orchards in your backyard. And some of the things can be avoided pretty easily, but a lot of it's just asking certain questions um, and your planning portion. Um, <clears throat> but for me, I love having orchards or even just a couple of fruit trees in the backyard is one of my favorite things. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why you would have fruit trees in your backyard or even a small scale orchard, even large scale orchard um, to make some income as well. Um, but for me, this is a picture that I took. We have quite a few different trees. This variety of peach is called a galaxy. It's a flat peach. Um, and that's one of the things I love about fruit trees is they're all a little bit different. They have unique flavors, textures, shapes. Um, but this is one that we quite like. Um, we sell it at the farmer's market a little bit as well, but um, kids absolutely love it. It's just fun. Um, but there's a lot of things to consider when you're trying to get a fruit tree. It's also a pretty large investment, especially anymore where fruit trees do cost quite a bit. So if you're going to make a large investment into a fruit tree for different reasons, of course, but um, there's a couple of things to keep in mind and consider before you make um, some of those um, decisions. So when you're looking at fruit trees, there's a lot of different reasons why people grow fruit trees. And I tried to narrow them down to just a couple of bullet points, but there are some other ones besides these ones. The number one that I've found that people want to grow fruit trees is, of course, for the produce. And they want to have a fresh local source of produce. They know what went into it or what was put on it. Um, you can get fruit that will ripen fully to maturity versus something that you has brought in from a... Um, a farm far away where it has to be picked usually a little bit green so it will travel and hold a lot better so there's a lot of different benefits for that fresh produce um, other people will grow fruit trees for profit um, usually a little bit larger scale um, but will uh, there's farmers markets um, that people will sell them at there's different csa per i mean there's a lot of different ways that you can sell for profit and fruit trees add a great variety to, to any uh, mixture and farm stand um, processing and preservation and cost savings on all bunch of those two together. And we see a lot more of this lately because of the inflation of everything. To be able to bottle a box of peaches um, has gotten quite expensive. One, you have to buy the jars and then you also have to buy the peaches or you have to buy the apples, um, all fruit and um, materials to do those um, processing. Um, activities has gone up. It costs quite a bit more than it used to. And if you can cut the cost down a little bit by having your own fruit trees and your own supply, um, it's definitely not free, but um, it might be um, a bit cheaper um, cost saving wise. Some people like it for the aesthetics. Um, this is a picture of our orchard that we have in Hurricane on one of the rare events that we actually had enough snow that it collected um, in Washington County in the St. George area. We don't get snow much, but we were able to get this picture. But the aesthetics is um, a lot of people will put in an orchard for the just for the aesthetics. Um, they look nice or um, even grapes or a vineyard. There are a lot of benefits to it. There's a cooling effect if you have them around your house. Um, some people grow them for tradition. That's what their family's always done, and they're going to grow fruit trees as well. There's a lot of health benefits to that. As we mentioned, um, ripe fruit has a lot of um, benefits to it for for our health as well um, and then environmental benefits and that comes um, takes into consideration the travel cost to get um, produce from one place to another there are some environmental impacts as we're shipping um, produce and foods around the world um, as, from that standpoint as well so there's a lot of different reasons why people grow fruit and I've met people that um, have one of those concerns um, or goals in mind when they're planting fruit trees. So the first question is like, well, if you want to grow fruit trees, what's the reason why? And that sometimes will determine your management strategies for growing fruit trees. Um, another thing to look at, and this is, is really critical if you just have a limited amount of space and you're in your backyard um, and you just don't have a lot of space to be able to grow a lot of fruit trees. Um, but the one thing to keep in mind is fruit trees do like um, full sun um, and they need about six to eight hours of um, direct sunlight to be able to produce um, good quality fruit. So all those leaves that are on the fruit trees are little solar panels and they're able to create nutrients and sugars that go into the fruit um, that they wouldn't be able to do it if they didn't have um, the sunlight to do that. So giving them a good spot that they're going to have um, full sun um, is something that is required for fruit trees if you're going to have good production. 
So looking at your backyard and gauging that, can I do that? Do I have a lot of shade trees already? Is there a place that a fruit tree makes sense? And then the biggest one for space and design, and this is something that's not new, but it's um, newer than um, my parents didn't have these options, but I definitely do, but that is the size of the tree. And we're able to do a lot of different things through root stocks on different cultivars of uh, fruit trees. So there's dwarfing root stocks, which are not as easy to find. You can usually order them. Some nurseries do a good job at carrying them and some don't. Most common are going to be semi-dwarf, especially with your apples, peaches, apricots, plums. Um, typically, when you go to a nursery, they're usually all semi-dwarf rooting stock. And once in a while, you'll find a dwarfing root stock as well. Um, but semi-dwarf is definitely the most common. And then when we get into cherries, they're usually on a mazard root stock, and that's going to be a standard full-size tree for the most part, um, which will get quite large, depending on the um, standard or the fruit type, they can get quite large. They can get 15 to 30 feet tall. They get quite large. Um, so on the slide, I put kind of the rough estimate of what the size can be. And this is if you're pruning them, you do need to prune each um, fruit tree, which is another consideration. But um, for a semi-dwarf, you can keep them to be about 5, 10 to 15 feet tall. In our orchard, we keep our, they're all in semi-dwarf rootstock. We're able to keep them about 10 feet tall so I can reach everything. We call them pedestrian orchards where you don't have to use ladders as much. Um, and there's some benefits to that as well. But that's one thing to consider is if you're looking at, I wanna get some fruit trees, how many can I get? Um, if I only have a 20 by 20 space in my backyard, um, I can't go out and buy five cherry trees, even though I would like that. Um, I love cherries, but if they all grew to their full potential, there's definitely not enough room for them. And a 20 by 20 section, that's kind of what I tried to illustrate with the pictures on the slide, is if I have a 20 by 20 section in my backyard that I can designate to fruit trees, um, and I'm looking at the size of the tree when it's fully mature, um, something on a standard root stock, so something like a cherry, they take up a lot of space. They can get 30 to 50 feet tall, 30 feet wide, and that's going to take up more than the space that I have in that 20 by 20 section. Um, but I can also, if I go to semi-dwarf, I can squeeze two trees in there. I might, if I'm really pruning very well. I might be able to squeeze three in there. It'd be close, um, but I can get two semi-dwarf rootstocks in there. Or if I can find the dwarfing rootstocks, I can put uh, four um, in that same section, um, in a 20 by 20 section. So there's options if you can find rooting stocks that have, that will regulate the size of the tree and keep them a little bit smaller. Um, the example I put at the bottom in the bottom left-hand corner, um, these are cherry examples. So you can find similar charts for apples. We don't have as many options when it comes to peaches and apricots and plums. Um, there are some out there for sure, but most of the work with rootstocks and dwarfing sized trees or fully dwarfed trees have been done with cherries and apples. Um, and a little bit with pears, but the other ones, we don't have as many options, but you can still definitely find them. We're still more work to be done on those for sure. The next thing is pollination. So once you know how many trees you can get in an area, we need to figure out if they need a pollinator or not. So some trees are self-pollinating while others, they require cross-pollination, which means the same variety or same type of fruit tree, but a different variety. So for example, if I have an apple, and we've talked about like Honeycrisp um, in another presentation, I love Honeycrisp. I can't have two Honeycrisp and have them pollinate each other. I have to have a Honeycrisp. For cross-pollination, I have to have a different variety. So I might do a Fuji or Fiji, however you want to say that one, or Gala, um, some of those different varieties to get them to get that cross-pollination going. Um, or if I'm pick, picking certain varieties of trees, they might be self-pollinating and I only need one and I wouldn't need two. So kind of as a, a general rule of thumb, and there are exceptions to this. Um, so when you're looking at the varieties of trees, do a little bit of research on each of them to make sure you have um, one that fits these um, I guess stereotypes or these rules. But we have self-pollinating, most peaches, apricots, grapes, some plums, there's a lot of exceptions. There's different varieties of plums. Some require a pollinator and some do not. And most figs that we buy, if you're into figs, um, are going to have um, a self-pollinating aspect to them. If you're going to buy apples or pears, 
most cherries with there's a couple of exceptions of cherries where they're self pollinating there's a couple varieties that will do that um, but most of them are going to need a second variety to cross pollinate some plums and if you get into the pluots and plum cots most of those require um, two different um, varieties to be able to cross pollinate um, so another thing to consider too, and this is fun if you're doing like a backyard type thing and you have a lot of neighbors, you can peek over the wall and you can see, does my neighbor have an apple tree already? Maybe I don't need to have two apple trees if my neighbor has one or if they have a cherry tree already, um, I might be able to get away. I may not, I can ask them if they know what variety it is so I can make sure I plant a different one. But if they have one cherry tree, they probably have another one somewhere to pollinate it. Um, if they're getting cherries and there's some loopholes and some things you can do if you have neighbors. Um, but if you're doing a larger scale orchard, typically you're going to be coming up with your own pollination um, options um, or cultivars to be able to make sure that happens with your trees. So one of the limiting factors that we have, we talked about this a bit already in a couple other presentations are our late frosts and Utah, um, and we're not necessarily special, but Utah, Idaho, um, parts of Arizona, Colorado, for sure, we all have this problem where it will warm up and then it will cool off. And we get these wide temperature swings. And if we get a really good warm snap to where things start to bloom or the buds start to swell and then it gets very cold, um, we can see crop loss, which isn't uncommon in a lot of areas. Um, and it has to do a little bit with our bloom time. Some fruit trees will definitely bloom more early than others and some bloom later. Um, I tried to put the general bloom order. And again, there's a lot of exceptions with fruit trees, but as a general rule, this is where most things will bloom. So some varieties of almonds bloom really early. Um, I usually see apricots are the first thing to bloom, apricots and plums. Um, they will bloom um, a couple, one to two weeks before anything else. Um, and if it gets cold again, it delays everything else that hasn't bloomed yet. So sometimes you can get these big gaps where your apricots have bloomed and then your peaches don't bloom for another month, depending on what the temperature swing does. Um, but apricots down in St. George, they're just about to bloom. So you can actually see the color of the blossoms on the tips. We've gotten warm enough on uh, this last week last two weeks that those buds have swollen and they are just about ready to pop um, but the peaches are still sucked in they haven't um, come along enough to where they're going to bloom but apricots first plums we see cherries shortly after that peaches and then pears and apples are last so if you're in an area that you're prone to get these late frosts um, and you're looking at this list you may not plant apricots because chances are you're not going to get apricots most years um, and that can drive your decision a little bit. If I know that and I want to get apricots like once every 10 years in some areas, I might be okay with that. And I'll just process a ton of apricots when I get them. Otherwise, it's just going to be a nice shade tree otherwise. But if I want something that's more reliable in some of our colder, not colder, but those areas that get those late frosts a little bit more, um, pears and apples are probably going to be your best bet. There are some varieties of each of these. There's some apricots that bloom a little bit later. There are some peaches that bloom a little bit later. If you're here for Wesley's presentation, they had a couple varieties of peaches that they were trying to um, keep track of and see where they're at and when they bloom. The most common ones that they had are Contender and Reliance, which are known for blooming a little bit later than all the other peaches do. And sometimes that week um, makes all the difference in the world from having fruit and ha not having fruit. So this is kind of a general list of something you can look at and base your decisions off of a little bit. Um, the ones at the bottom of the list bloom later, the ones at the top typically bloom a bit earlier. Um, and almonds are kind of a funny one. There's a lot of diff couple different varieties. Some of them bloom really early and some of them are closer to the peaches when they actually bloom. So you'll have to look at a, a bloom calendar and see when they uh, typically bloom. Um, but one of the misconceptions with Utah and fruit trees is, is our really cold temperatures that dictate if we can plant a lot of these fruit trees. And it's not necessarily the temperature. The trees will do fine, but the fruit may not make it if we get those cold swings um, that we can get in the spring and even in the fall. If we get a really early cold snap and we have a very late um, fruit variety, sometimes we can lose that fruit variety before we're able to get it picked. So it kind of works on both ends of the calendar, unfortunately, with um, with Utah. But late frost, that's one to consider. 
Um, maybe look at some of those later varieties or later fruit tree types um, if you want fruit every year, for sure. Um, the other one, this is where a lot of people don't understand the amount of time that can go into fruit trees or is needed at different points of the year. It's not like you're not going to be out there every year or every day doing something, but at certain points of the year, certain things have to happen um, for you, ha you to have a good crop. Um, some of those are irrigation, and that can be a pretty minimal one if you hook it into an irrigation timer and have um, your own drip system or sprinklers to water up. Um, fertilizer application usually happens once a year and then you're done. Um, pruning, depending on how large the tree is or however many you have, can take several days um, to prune your trees. Um, thinning fruit um, usually takes a bit of time. Um, depending on the size of the tree, um, pest management or pest sprays, and of course, harvesting. And most of the time when we're planting fruit trees, we skip the first um, five bullet points and we just think about the harvesting. But we have to remember each of these other ones has to take place and able to, for us to be able to have a good crop of, of whatever we're growing, whether it's apples or peaches, they all need these different steps. So the pictures that I have on here on the, the right, the... The one in the top corner, these are apples and they were not thinned. They're actually getting a little bit too far along, um, but they do, they could still definitely be thinned. But for apples, those most of those need to be taken off so we can have one fruit by itself that's going to be able to grow, not rub against other ones, um, and be able to create a larger or a better, higher quality fruit. But apples require quite a bit of thinning. And then peaches, this other one, this one should have been thinned heavier. It was thinned okay, but it should have been thinned a little bit heavier. For the spacing we're looking at, we wanted to have about six inches between each peach for them to grow and um, mature the best they can. You can tell that there's a lot of strain on these branches too. They're hanging down quite a bit. Um, they shouldn't necessarily be that low, but thinning helps reduce the load on the branches and helps with your fruit size and quality. But it's one that has to happen every year. It's very difficult for a lot of people because you take the fruit off and you drop it on the ground, but it's something that has to happen. Um, but there is a bit of labor. So keep that in mind when you're gonna purchase fruit trees, these steps do need to happen each year. The other one that's a little bit daunting, and I'm glad you're at this workshop because that's what this workshop's designed to do is to help you with your endeavors with um, fruit trees or whatever it is. Um, but pest management can be a little bit of a daunting one because there's there are different pests. Every fruit tree has its own kind of unique set of pests or each category of fruit trees. Um, and some of it, there's a little bit of a learning curve, what pests there are, and then how do I manage them? There's different ways to manage them as well. Um, organic has come a very long way in my lifetime um, to the point where we actually use a lot of the organic um, products um, commercially to be able to, to treat some of these pests. And they do a very good job. Um, and there's conventional um, methods, which sometimes those in certain circumstances work extremely well too and might be the better option, depending on what you're trying to control. But some of the questions that um, I try and get people to think about a little bit is when they're buying a fruit tree as well, what should I expect or what pest should I be on the lookout for? Uh, so the top right picture, this is one that we don't have in Southern Utah, but they we have it quite a bit in Northern Utah and that's the cherry fruit fly. So it lays an egg which hatches, hatches into a maggot and that goes inside the cherry. And that's what that picture is. Um, so if you're in an area where you have, you've had a lot of cherry production in the past, or you're aware that you have this problem, um, you can put out, there's different traps you can put out just to see if the, the fly is there. And then you can treat if it is a problem. If it's not a problem, I wouldn't treat it. Um, but if you know that it's gonna be a problem in your area, um, plan on having some kind of a management strategy to, to handle it. Um, Claudia talked about a couple fungal problems or fungus problems that we have um, in our state. We, we're really blessed really in Utah that we don't have a lot. We Fungus requires and bacteria re require a hot, humid environment to be able to, to thrive and do well. And we see a lot of fungal problems in those climates, but we are hot definitely in different parts of the state, but we're really not humid. So we don't see a lot of problems. So we're there's just one or two that we really um, have to look out for. And Claudia mentioned the, the two that I see the most. Um, and that's gonna be the fire blight with apples and pears and then cranium blight um, with our stone fruits. And that shows up in the, the leaves and in the on the fruit. 
And then the last thing I wanted to mention is when you are spraying, and Claudia hit on this really well, but try and have at least two, preferably three different products that you use. And you can do that within the organic realm really easy. Or if you're doing com uh, conventional products, um, um, it's probably a little bit easier to do that because there's more options. But switch up what you're spraying with. Um, so you can spray with um, if you're doing organic, you can spray with a product called Spinosad, um, works really well on a lot of, depends on the pest, so you have to read the label on each product that you use, make sure it covers your pest, um, and you follow the label's instructions, um, and then I could switch and I could use BT or pyrethrin or another organic product um, to spray my trees. But pest management, um, in my opinion, and having um, grown quite a few fruit trees, um, is something that is required, um, especially for stone fruits. We do see a lot of mortality with bores in uh, fruit trees um, or stone fruits. So we get there's the lesser peach twig bore and there's the greater peach twig bore. Um, but once those go into the tree, we can see branches that'll die out if they go in towards the trunk, especially on a young tree, we'll see a lot of mortality there. So spraying them with some kind of uh, compound to, to kill those insects or to prevent it from going into our trees um, is something that's um, required if you're going to have good success with your, your orchards. Um, nutrient deficiencies. We really don't have a huge amount of nutrient deficiencies when it comes to our macronutrients or our micronutrients, I mean, but the three nutrients, so one macro and two micros that we do see a lot of in the state of Utah. Um, these have been hit on as well. Um, and Claudia mentioned nutrient deficiencies are often um, uh, misread, I guess, to be some type of a fungal problem. But we have iron, zinc, and nitrogen. And with fruit trees specifically, and the reason I put those on here is iron and zinc are ones that we do see a lot of deficiency in. Um, and nitrogen is something when you fertilize your fruit trees, you're going to give them nitrogen every year so they have good growth. We don't have a lot of nitrogen in our soils in Utah, so that's why I can say you will add nitrogen each year. But the iron and zinc is something that you can get a chelated form. If you know that you have a problem with this in your yard already, it's something you can just add to them each year if you would like. But one of the things that they, some of the traits and the characteristics that you can see, um, Claudia mentioned a lot of them with the yellowing leaves and the green veins. Um, and doing a leaf tissue test, they're really not too expensive. You can send some leaves up to Utah State and it can tell you if it's iron or zinc or manganese is one I didn't li list on here or magnesium. Um, but with zinc, this picture in the right with peach trees, this is something I see quite frequently if you have a zinc deficiency. You'll see the rosettes on the very tips of the branches. They look like palm trees. Those are actually peach twigs. <laughs> um, they're not palm trees, but they look like it. The rosettes on the top are the new leaves that have come out, and then there's these bald spots, and then they will leaf out a little bit farther down. Um, those bald spots are an indication that you have a zinc deficiency, and using a chelated zinc um, each year to help raise those zinc levels in the soil a little bit will help to reduce that quite a bit. But that's, for nutrient deficiencies, these are really the only ones that we tend to see um, somewhat frequently across the state of Utah. Some of that depends on your soil type a little bit, um, but those are the nutrients that we are usually deficient in. So a couple of resources to help. Um, so I know going through some of those, it's some of it's a lot, especially when we get to the pest uh, management side of things, but there are a lot of resources to help. Um, some things you can definitely do on your own, you can research on your own, um, but we do have USU extension offices in each county that will have typically an agriculture agent and a horticulture agent or a combination of the two um, in one position. But there's someone that can help to answer some of those questions. And if they're not able to, they have the resources to find someone that definitely can. Um, I use local nurseries quite a bit, especially when I'm picking varieties. So a lot of nurseries have had a lot of experience in those areas of um, variety selection. Um, and they will um, have a lot of good input on what to pick um, and even some of the pests that you'll have in the area. So if they're really great people to, to bug and quiz and grill about um, what they see in their area, what does well and what they can treat um, problems with. There's also a lot of gardening groups. Um, there's in-person gardening groups, which are a lot of fun, or there's also the social media ones. There's a lot on Facebook, a lot on Instagram. And that you can join these different groups and then they bounce ideas back and forth or ask questions to see what everyone thinks. And those can be great. Oftentimes they'll have um, 
experts in different fields to help answer certain questions in certain um, categories. Um, some other ones I put on here, these are QR codes. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how to find those on, we'll jump to a Google page here in a second. Um, but there's a couple of advisories that are just phenomenal that I use quite a bit in my own garden. Um, and I'd be a little bit lost to be perfectly honest without some of them. So there's, and these you could do as a Google search um, and you could find them just as easy, but you could do USU IPM. IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management, but we have a really good website. And I've looked at a lot of different universities and ours is, is phenomenal. So our, our team there has done a really, really good job to help us. And that's the picture on the right. That's a picture of the webpage that we're gonna go to in a minute. And I'll show you um, a little bit about that and how to navigate it. Um, this other one is an advisory subscription. So we do have advisories that come out in the mail um, somewhat as needed or monthly, um, especially we're in the growing season. And you can pick different advisories that you want to subscribe to, and then they'll send you a newsletter um, once a month. So I'm going to try and we'll share a different screen. So we'll go to a Google page and hopefully this works the way I envision it working. But so again, if you did a Google search, I could do a Google search just in the top. So USU IPM. And that would take you to the integrated pest management page for USU. I'm interested in agricultural pests. And it takes me to this page. From here, I can look at each of the different um, popular or main varieties that we have. Oh, thanks Ruby, put that in the chat. Advisory subscription link, if you wanna click on it and subscribe, it's a great one. Um, but anyways, I can look at agricultural pests. I can pick, these are the fruits and below it, you also have vegetables, which is phenomenal as well. And I've spent hours on here, guys. It's been, I, I enjoy it. I'm a little bit of a geek that way, I guess, but it's been fun. But if I'm interested in growing cherries, we'll do cherries, for example. Um, it has a really nice general, overview of cherry pests. So I can jump on that one as long as it loads. And I can see these are some of the common things I could look at um, that I would just want to be on the lookout for. So it has a little bit about the cherry fruit fly. Um, and if I want to learn a little bit more about those, I would just go back a page. I should open a new page. So I'll go back here. Um, and I could learn about the peach twig borer if I wanted to, because that affects cherries just as much as peaches. Um, black cherry aphids, which is a common one. So I could click on that one, learn a little bit about them, the description, their biology, and then their management. So residential has some recommendations. And for commercial, and this is the one I use a bit just because I have a lot of trees. Um, I can look at that one and see what options are there as well. So that's a resource that's really great. Um, and I use it quite a bit. Um, another one that I um, will touch on really quick, and this will be the last one. I didn't include this on the slides. I forgot to add it. But if you do a Google search for USU traps, Utah traps, um, let's do that. So if I do a Google search, it comes here and takes me to this website. Um, one of the questions that we often get is when should I spray my fruit trees? Um, phenomenal question. It's really hard to answer because our weather is so fun and it changes and insects are dependent on temperatures. So what we've done is we create, we use the weather stations. That's what all these little dots are across the state of Utah and up into Idaho. Um, I can select orchards and then I would pick the location that's closest to me. So um, Leeds is close to me if I want to do that one. If a lot of you guys are probably up north, we could do, let's do Santa Quinn since there's a lot of trees there. We'll do Santa Quinn East. Um, I can come over here, I can pick a pest for fruit. I'm interested in the We'll stick with the cherry, Western cherry fruit fly. I can pick that one, submit. Um, it pulls up a calendar. This is the forecast. And then we've calculated our average for normal. So we're able to predict if there's any action that we need to take in the forecast and for the next month or so. 
on this very end column, since it's the middle of winter, there's not really any actions that we're expected to take. So if there was an action, you would scroll down, it would have a little icon here you would click on, and that would tell you if you need to spray during that period of time. So I'm hoping that's helpful. That is something to answer the question of when do I spray? This is probably the best resource you could ever hope to find. Um, I don't know how else you would pick it. Um, you would just spray monthly and hope you pick, you had a date that was correct. Um, you can adjust the date too. So you could go back um, a year, for example, um, and you could see what the, the recommendation were was there, so. Anyways, so that was kind of the end of the presentation. Um, I'll put this up as our kind of our end slide for the fruit session, but I guess we'll, with that, we can answer what questions we have in the Q&A or in the chat, I guess. Yeah, Ben, thank you so much. Um, I think that was an awesome overview. And I really love the fact you talk about the uh, tree fruit maintenance. <laughs> Because <laughs> I agree, I think sometimes it gets kind of skipped over and it's such an important part of um, growing tree fruit and correctly maintaining the trees. It's it's a labor of love, but we get uh, yeah, we so get amazing off. fruit out of it. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, you do have a couple questions. Um, one is if you were to plant one cherry tree for a zone four, what would you suggest? Are we talking, maybe this person can respond back if you're talking a sweet cherry for a tart cherry, but mm -hmm. maybe you could give us one of each if you can think of one. That, zone four is a little bit- <laughs> I was gonna say, you're about a zone eight, so. <laughs> yeah, to relate. Um, you, for zone four, it kind of depends on, so Cedar City, I used to live there and they were probably a zone six. Um, they did not get cherries very often just because of the late freezes they would get. And it seems with the lower zones we get, we get, more of that dramatic swing. If you were just going to plant one cherry tree, though, there's two that we often see and suggest to grow that are self-fruitful. One is called Lapins, L-A-P-I-N-S, and the other one is called Estella, or just Stella, not a Stella, Stella, S-T-E-L-L-A. They're both self-fruitful. Lapins is the one that I like a bit more. They both bloom about the same time, um, if you can find one that blooms a little bit later, um, that would be great. But the Lapin seems to be a little bit larger of a fruit, but doesn't produce as many. And Stella produces smaller cherries and a ton of them. Um, they're both good, but I like larger cherries. And they seem to be a little bit more juicy, so I like the Lapins. But it kind of comes down to user preference. But my concern with the zone is it might you may not get cherries very often. Maybe not every year. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're lucky when you get them. Um, and, you know, I just really want to echo what Ben said. There's just a plethora of, especially I'd say fruit production resources on our website. I know we do have some fact sheets that are de devoted to cherry production, apple production, pear production that um, will give some variety recommendations, um, but give you all kinds of other information on um, maintenance and care. So definitely something to check out there. Um, to help answer some of those types of questions. But of course, Ben's a phenomenal resource when it comes to those types of questions too. Yep, um, here's a... All the time. <laughs> oh, we know you are. Uh, here is a, a question from Grace. Great question. Um, would having free range chickens or ducks or chicken or duck tractors around fruit trees help with a large portion of pest control or just a small amount? Oh, that's a great question. I really like that one. It depends a little bit on the pest. Um, overall, I don't think it would help a huge amount because most of the pests that we have are very host selective. So they like fruit trees and they usually don't hang out in the grass too much. Um, if you have a lot of like aphid problems, we do see some aphids will start on the orchard floor and can move up into the trees. Um, and ducks would love those um, and help maybe um, keep them down a little bit. But um, for our peach twig borers, um, the fruit, fruit fly might, they might do a little bit of damage, but you're still gonna have, have some damage, but they're very host specific. They don't, usually don't hang out where the ducks and the, the chickens are at much, but yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point is um, it really depends on where those pests are located in the tree. And a lot of times they are up in the tree, up in the canopy. So unfortunately they might not help as much. If you have um, snails though, I've heard ducks are phenomenal on, on snails. Yeah. 
There you go. So yeah. um, I did.